The Trail series is littered with amazing characters across every single arc. It has many of my favorite video game characters of all time. Perhaps the ultimate example of excellent character work in this series is seen with the main character of the very first games in the Trails arc of the Legend of Heroes series, and that character is, of course, the one and only Estelle Bright. If you had told me when I first began Trails in the Sky first chapter that Estelle would end up not only being one of my favorite characters in the series, but arguably my favorite video game protagonist of all time, I would have scoffed. Estelle is the embodiment of Trail's famous ability to take a character that seems generic to begin with and turn them into a deep and sympathetic character with magnificent character development. In this video, I will take a look at how that development happened over the course of the three Trails in the Sky games and why it turned Estelle Bright from a character I felt apathetic to at the beginning of the game to a character I unconditionally love by the end of the journey. A quick warning to those who have not played all three Trails in the Sky games, this video will have many many spoilers in it. If you want to know about the game series Estelle Bright is from, go ahead and check out my Why You Should Play Trails in the Sky video. This video also is not going to spend a lot of time explaining terms used in universe in the interest of focusing on the character of Estelle, so a familiarity with the series will be helpful. For those of you who remain, it's time to begin our dive into what makes Estelle Bright a fantastic character. To quickly address a point some Trails fans may bring up, I am aware that Estelle appears in more games in the series than just the Trails in the Sky arc where she is the most important character in the games. This video will not tackle any appearances in the other games because 1 they haven't been fully localized yet, and 2 because I think the Sky games alone are enough to prove that Estelle is a great character. I shall start with the basics of who Estelle is at the beginning of her story. Estelle Bright is the daughter of single dad Cassius Bright. Her mom died in the Hundred Days War between Liberal and Erebonia while protecting Estelle. She was born and raised in the small town of Roland in Liberal, and from a young age spent much of her time bug catching, fishing, and staff wielding. Not long after the Hundred Days War, Cassius, in the course of his work, confronted a young assassin sent to kill him named Joshua Astray. After soundly defeating the boy, he then protected him from retaliation from the assassin's group for his failure, and brought him back home to raise him as a member of the Bright family. Of course, being Cassius, he presents Estelle with Joshua as a gift. Cue the first of many amazing Estelle lines. This opening scene with young Estelle gives us a good picture of an energetic girl who is used to getting her own way, and this scene has some amazing Estelle lines. It's a good baseline for understanding what she's like and what to expect from her method of problem solving. Five years later, 16-year-old Estelle is trying to become a junior bracer, aided by Joshua, who is also trying to become a junior bracer. Estelle shows she certainly has the physical capacity and the drive to do bracer work, but her focus is lacking, and she has a tendency to disregard the parts of the job that don't come naturally to her. An early quote that may be overlooked subtly indicates this fact after Estelle remarks on the difficulty of playing the harmonica, and Joshua responds, Compared to what it takes to use a staff, I think the harmonica is much easier. It's really just a matter of concentration. Concentration being something Estelle is sometimes in short supply of. This is why it's very helpful she has the calm presence of Joshua there to offset Estelle's difficulty focusing. Soon after assuming their junior bracer duties though, they get the news that Cassius' airship had disappeared, and that kicks off the main events of the game. At the start then, we have Estelle, the energetic, impulsive, talented, friendly to most, and somewhat spacey new bracer. All of these traits are very evident to the player and to the other characters, with Joshua having resigned himself to Estelle's antics. The game also does a great job of showing how her traits are both good and bad for the work she is doing. No matter what the request, she always gives her all and jumps in without a moment's hesitation. Which means she sometimes gets herself in too deep, such as when Cassius has to rescue Joshua and Estelle in the Esmelas Tower. On the other side, she usually has to be reminded that she needs to carefully look around during investigations, such as when the Septium Crystal was stolen from the mayor's house. 
Once she does focus on an investigation, however, she shows she's got the mindset for investigative work. She just needs the willingness. Many of her traits have good and bad sides to them. Her friendliness gives her instant connections with many people, but it also makes her too trusting at times. She is quick to anger, especially when someone has gotten on her nerves, but this has also allowed her to be decisive in critical moments. Like a real person, Estelle has strengths and weaknesses, and sometimes they are great for a situation, and sometimes they're terrible. What a lot of these traits lack backing them up, though, is maturity and experience. That's the biggest thing that Estelle gains over the course of the games, and that growth allows her to navigate tricky situations she never could have done at the beginning of her journey. The first shock to her life comes with Cassius' disappearance. It gives her a new purpose and mission after accomplishing her goal of becoming a bracer. She also then gets the chance to travel outside of Roland and meet many new people, presenting her with new experiences and especially new perspectives from the people she meets. She experiences great success and crushing failure, but she always has a strong support network around her to help her overcome those tough times. It may have started as a journey for just Estelle and Joshua, but by the end, Estelle has an excellent and varied group of friends helping her. Her relationship with Joshua, though, remains most important among all of them. Over the course of the game, we see Estelle struggle with growing romantic feelings for Joshua, perhaps most prominent during the play arc when Joshua does a stage kiss with their good friend and complete opposite in terms of personality to Estelle, Chloe. More about that later. It gets pushed to the side by the events of the liberal coup led by Colonel Richard, which is foiled by Estelle and others, but it rears its head back up right at the end in one of the worst cliffhangers in video game history. Joshua has had his memories restored of his time as an assassin of Ouroboros by Weissman, one of the leaders of Ouroboros. Weissman also reveals that Joshua has been feeding the society information on Cassius and Estelle unknowingly for years. Distraught at the revelation, Joshua decides to leave, but not before confessing his feelings for Estelle, after she confesses them first, because let's face it, Estelle's not waiting around for anyone. Calling her his son, this is important and will come up again, and sharing a kiss laced with a sleeping drug before departing. Cue the end of Trails in the Sky first chapter. Now, if that's not the worst way to have your crush confess their feelings to you, I hope I never find out a worse way. This sequence of events leaves Estelle reeling. As we know from watching them work throughout the game, Estelle relies on Joshua a lot to help her on requests. He was her emotional support, her calming influence, her maturity, and also a helpful ally in battle. With him gone, Estelle rapidly goes through a period of denial and depression seen in the start of Trails in the Sky second chapter when she convinces herself he can't have left, that he's just waiting at home. Which, of course, he isn't. After finally accepting that he is truly gone, Estelle has a choice. She can give in to despair, or she can do something about it. This moment is a huge moment for her development, not because she chooses to do something about it, because let's face it, pity parties are not Estelle's thing, but with how she chooses to do something about it. She recognizes her own weaknesses and limitations, and decides to train as hard as possible to overcome them, because that's the only way she'll achieve what she wants to achieve. This step forward starts with her resolving to find out more about the society Ouroboros, and also to track down Joshua and bring him back home, whatever it took. The old Estelle may have just rushed off to do that without a plan, but instead she takes up her father's suggestion for additional training with fellow bracer Annalise. Cue an amazing duel. I know this is a video about Estelle as a character, but gotta shout out Falcom for the amazing animation in this scene. After witnessing poetry in motion, Annalise remarks on how much Estelle has changed since they first met, a realization that all the players have undergone in the previous game. Estelle went from, I'm a naive, innocent newbie, to having some steel in your soul, as Annalise puts it. She is up to all of the challenges Kurt throws at her, and completes her training in an exemplary manner, especially with the final trial. During that final trial, she takes the lead and triumphs by relying on her own judgment, exactly what she thought she needed training in. And that improvement is evident as she starts taking the lead more often in her journey during Trails in the Sky second chapter. 
After completing her training, Estelle pairs up with a more senior bracer, either Sherizard or Agate. But despite that, Estelle maintains the leadership role. Sure, she's still excitable and ready to jump in at a moment's provocation, but she's shored up on her focus and is ready to tackle problems with tactics other than hit them with her staff. Although, to be fair, that approach does solve many problems, or at least all the ones related to Oliver. Her journey now takes her in direct conflict with the enforcers of Ouroboros, of whom we'd already met Lo, the toughest enemy in all of Sky First Chapter, and the rest of the enforcers aren't any easier. Her encounters with the enforcers starting with Lublon, and extending to Luciola, Walter, and René, I refuse to pronounce that name any other way, drive home to Estelle just how dangerous the society is. To her credit, this only strengthens her will. Her determination is seen in every step of the journey, allowing her to combat the enforcers on a large scale by thwarting their plans, while also strengthening herself to do what she needs to do on a personal level which can be seen best in her overcoming Luciola's dream-inducing fog. When she breaks free of the happy illusion of her family alive and happy, by realizing Joshua is still out there and she has more she needs to do, you can see how much she has grown as a person. You see, in Trails in the Sky for Estelle, there has so far usually been two goals happening. One smaller personal struggle amid a larger country-wide threat. The start of Sky's second chapter is a good example of this. Personal struggle getting stronger in order to find Joshua and bring him back to his family, larger struggle opposing the plans of Ouroboros and Liberal. These struggles do intersect occasionally though, such as with Rene. The sweet and murderous Angel of Slaughter is part of that larger struggle, but also sets up a later personal struggle that is another crucial step in Estelle's development although that struggle doesn't resolve until beyond the scope of these games. Before meeting up with Rene, it was easy for Estelle to just see the Enforcers as twisted, selfish adults. But Rene spoils all of that by being a child who was clearly rescued by the society and made into a killer, much like Joshua before her. Estelle's choice with regards to Rene is therefore very much tied to her feelings towards Joshua and his time with Ouroboros. It is never too late for someone to seek redemption, which is an important part of Estelle's worldview, influenced by people important to her. Hold on to that for the moment though, because plot stuff is happening again. After Estelle and crew invade the Ouroboros base on Valeria Lake, Estelle gets captured by Weissman and brought to the society's glorious airship. There, Estelle receives the offer to join the society, with Weissman promising that if she did, she could then be reunited with Joshua. In addition to having Joshua reunite with Lo, who is basically Joshua's older brother, this prospect excites Rene especially since she was mentored by Joshua before he left the society, and had connected with Estelle while pretending to be a lost girl in their adventures in the capital. Estelle, being the brilliant person she is, rejects this offer, which is understandable given she just tried to bash Feisman's head in with her staff. Unfortunately, Lo stops her, and later on after she's been brought back to her quarters, Lo remarks that he knew she would reject the offer. She doesn't have the darkness necessary to be drawn to the power of being an enforcer. Lo also takes the time to inform Estelle about Joshua's backstory and the death of Joshua's sister, Karen. Lo's insightful statement about Estelle is extremely accurate. In fact, perhaps Estelle's greatest strength is that she is not drawn to power. She is drawn to people, and in return, people are drawn to her and her forceful personality. She does not have the allies she has by accident. In this case, though, she doesn't need allies to break out of her room and wreak havoc on the ship before getting a bit over her head and being aided by none other than Joshua, who had snuck on board with the help of the Capua Sky Bandits. By teaming up, Joshua and Estelle managed to steal a ship and escape the Glorious, in part because Joshua rigged explosives in the engine room to distract Lo. They then land the ship on the beach and have a conversation that frankly could be the topic of its own video. It's arguably the most powerful scene in the entire series. Joshua starts it out by acknowledging he was happy to see her, but this is it, and Estelle shouldn't chase after him anymore, that they could never be together. Which leads to Estelle calling out what a terrible liar he is. Estelle then points out that she's experienced a lot since he left, and that she's figured out why he left. 
a reason he didn't even recognize himself. He's scared. He blames himself for his sister's death and couldn't stand to lose Estelle as well. Every barrier he puts up, she pushes aside as if it never existed. And while it's blunt, it's also empathetic and reasoned. Estelle says she understands, and she does. She's not going to let his self-pity and fear get in the way anymore. The Burl's number one Joshua Watcher got right to the heart of the matter in a way only she could. But Estelle had to go through a lot to get to this point as well. This scene shows Estelle's incredible emotional maturity. Estelle of Trails in the Sky first chapter could not have done this scene. She finishes it off by telling Joshua he can't keep her from danger. It's her job. It's her choice. It's who she is. The best way to keep each other from danger, then, is for them to stick together. And finally, after all that searching, Estelle has brought Joshua back. Estelle shines as bright as the sun in this scene. It is a fantastic culmination of one of her personal arcs of the second chapter. Estelle reached this point by focusing on what made her unique and great to begin with, such as her enthusiasm and relentless drive, and by gaining experience doing some extensive self-reflection, she managed to improve her focus and confidence. She is an admirable young woman. As Joshua says, Estelle has matured a lot while they were apart, but that setup of maturity began from the very first moment Estelle became a junior bracer. Oh, you thought we were done? No, no, no. We've still got the rest of second chapter and all of Trails in the Sky the third to go. With Joshua back in that main personal mission fulfilled, attention turns to other characters' personal arts and the overall bigger picture problem of Ouroboros' plan. Not that Estelle doesn't get in some more moments to show off how good a bracer she is now, such as during the negotiation between Erebonia and Laburl. For the most part, though, the rest of the game is about fighting Ouroboros, not any personal demons. At least until the Bright Brigade, that's what I'm calling them, faces off against Renee again. This time, she learns more about why Renee is with Ouroboros. She was left by her parents with strangers and was then stolen away along with other kids, many of whom died in the horrific circumstances. Then Lo and Joshua saved her and brought her to Ouroboros, where she became, as she puts it, strong. This sets up the final battle against Renee at the Axis Pillar. Renee challenges Estelle to beat her in battle or else Renee wouldn't talk to her. And Estelle, of course, does. Before continuing onwards to challenge the rest of Ouroboros, though, she needs to talk to the little girl, not the Ouroboros Enforcer. Estelle slaps Renee, telling her off for hurting people, to which Renee responds by stating Estelle is just like everyone else. Instead of getting angry or defensive, Estelle responds by hugging Renee. Clearly not the response Renee expected, and she likes it until she starts and pushes away from Estelle. This wonderful demonstration proves to Renee that Estelle isn't like everyone else, because she cares for Renee, the person. Unable to face this possibility, Renee runs away. As before, focus returns to the bigger issue at stake, but Ouroboros and Weissman specifically are no match for Estelle and crew. It does seem all hope is lost when the collapsing Liber Arc takes Estelle and Joshua down with it, but thankfully Draconex Machina happens and they are saved. The game ends with Joshua and Estelle visiting Joshua's sister Karen's grave. The repetition of how Estelle is shining like the sun, and their next step on their journey to travel and help Joshua atone for his past misdeeds, and to find Renee. Trails in the Sky the Third then follows after. And as most of you likely know, Estelle is not the main character of this game. The focus is instead on the priest Kevin Graham, with Estelle in the supporting cast. And she doesn't even join until more than halfway through. This game mostly reinforces Estelle as a person who can instantly bond with others, seen with her quick connection with the one new character in the cast of this game, Reese, and as a shining sun in everyone's life. Plus, it shows off her desire to bring Renee into the Bright family as Renee also gets transported into the Phantasma. Turns out, she knows Joshua and Estelle have been chasing after her, and while she seems happy to see them when she thinks it's a dream, she responds negatively as soon as she realizes it isn't one. Nothing will deter Estelle from her goal of redeeming Renee just as she managed with Joshua previously. At the end, when everyone is leaving, Renee breaks down after Joshua correctly identifies Renee's issue with potentially never seeing the people she cares about again. 
Estella then comes in with another amazing speech about the fact that at some point, you'll have to say goodbye to all those you love. It's once again a speech that shows Estelle's incredible maturity and empathy, and displays a nurturing side she hasn't always shown up till now. It ties to Estelle wanting to be together with Renee because our time is limited. We should spend it with those we care about, and as Joshua puts it, we want to be your family, Renee. Renee then yells that she hates them both, but at the same time loves them just as much. This personal arc will continue into the rest of the series, but I'm not talking about that in this video. And thus end Trails in the Sky, the third. That was a lot of talk about the story summary, but now I'm going to pivot into talking about important characters for Estelle and her character arc. I've already touched on many of the points for the first two of the five characters I'm going to talk about, and those two are Joshua and Renee. They have lots of similarities. They had tragedy come for them early in life, and were rescued out of it by Ouroboros, who sought to train them up into unfeeling killers. This plan succeeded until a member of the Bright family proved too much for them, Cassius for Joshua, and Estelle for Renee. The realization that their strength wasn't everything broke something in their facades of confidence, and who was there to repair that break with unwavering optimism, love, and forgiveness? Estelle Bright the sun that banishes away the shadows and redeems those it warms. Joshua and Renee may resist the light, but like all the people around Estelle, they are also drawn to it. Joshua stated in his departure letter to Cassius after the events of first chapter that he would disappear from their lives like a shadow dispelled by the sun. Instead, he was illuminated by it, just like Renee. They can try to hide and run away, but the sun follows and shines on them wherever they go unconditionally, and that's why Estelle is able to help them see that they do belong in the light out of the shadows of Ouroboros. The next character to talk about, though, is perhaps the most powerful character in the entire Trail series and Estelle's father, Cassius Bright. Many characters in the Trail series have someone they are trying to live up to. This applies to protagonists, antagonists, side characters, you name it. Whether it's a family member, a mentor, or a hero, many characters have someone they strive to be like, and Estelle is no exception. In fact, she may have the toughest person to live up to in the whole cast. Cassius Bright is the hero of the Hundred Days War, one of only four S-rank bracers on the continent, later the Brigadier General of the Royal Army and the Divine Blade. Of course, Estelle doesn't know this starting off, she just knows he's a top bracer in Roland, and she wants to be even stronger and better than he is. Her desire to be a bracer, her use of the same bow staff, and even her love for fishing can all be traced back to Cassius. He helped nurture her into the driven and enthusiastic person she is, and even if he gives off supreme dad energy, it is clear they are a loving family and he did everything he could to provide for his daughter before and after his wife's death. Most importantly, he shows Estelle how to redeem people, how to never give up on helping everyone. Cassius originally saved Joshua and brought him home. Cassius pulled Sherazad from the darkness and gave Colonel Richard and the Intelligence Division a second chance. These lessons in forgiveness were perhaps the most important trait Cassius bestowed upon his daughter and is a major reason why she could accomplish things no one else can. Moving on from Estelle's father and mentor, it's time to talk about her two biggest foils in the Trails in the Sky cast. A foil is a character that highlights someone else's trait, usually by contrast. Joshua could apply here, but there are two other ones that are more appropriate, and that I haven't talked a lot about already. Starting with Chloe Rins, slash Claudia von Ossiles. Chloe and Estelle are very different in personality. The trope Red Oni, Blue Oni applies almost perfectly to Chloe and Estelle, linked to the TV trope page in the description. Estelle's color scheme is usually red or orange, while Chloe's is blue or purple. Estelle is passionate, aggressive, and enthusiastic. Chloe is serene, refined, and quiet. If that wasn't enough, they are literally cast as the Ruby Knight and the Azure Knight in the Genesis School play, Madrigal of the White Magnolia. Despite very different personalities, they strike up a near-instant connection and become very close friends. Estelle, though, is conscious of their differences, and it doesn't help that Chloe also develops a crush on Joshua and does a stage kiss with him in the aforementioned play. 
On top of all that, Chloe is very similar in personality to Joshua and is specifically mentioned in comparison to Joshua's deceased sister Karen. At one point, Estelle even thinks that Joshua would be better off with someone like Chloe, who has a more compatible personality and is more traditionally feminine than Estelle. Chloe, though, could tell that Joshua only had eyes for Estelle, and she expresses how impressed she is with Estelle's strength of purpose. Estelle and Chloe are different in circumstance of personality, but they are both selfless, kind, and strong people, making them a pair of great friends and great characters to build off of each other. That leads to the other foil, who unlike Chloe, has a very similar personality to Estelle's, and maybe that's why they clash so much. Yes, I'm talking about Josette Capua, the former Erebonian noble turned Sky Bandit. She is introduced posing as a calm, serene Genesis Academy student, so basically Chloe before Chloe. And in that guise, Estelle gets along really well with her. After it comes out that she was fooling Estelle in order to steal a crystal, and she is completely different from the act, the rivalry begins. Josette is also hot-headed and tomboyish, the latter of which Estelle somewhat hypocritically uses as a derogatory nickname for Josette, to which Josette responds by calling Estelle an airhead, which may also be somewhat hypocritical. That would probably have been it if Joshua had not enlisted Josette and the other Capua's help in his plan against Ouroboros in second chapter. During that time, Josette develops a crush on Joshua, and Estelle finds out about Joshua pairing up with her and the Sky Bandits leading to jealousy and insecurity. Likely because, although she doesn't want to admit it, Estelle recognizes the similarities between Josette and her. Joshua's description of his friendship with Josette to Estelle once they've reunited could in fact apply to Estelle as well. Well, at first we had our differences. Even so, we came to understand each other pretty well, I'd say. Their similarities are striking. So what is the big difference between the two beyond personal circumstances? The difference that makes Josette an effective foil by highlighting a crucial distinction between them? I would say it's Estelle's optimism and selfless nature. Josette is more cynical and more selfish, which isn't necessarily bad, just different, and explains why Joshua fell for one and not the other. To summarize a very long argument here, Estelle is a strong character because her character growth is believable and inspiring. She starts out enthusiastic, brash, and optimistic, but immature, and over the course of the games develops her maturity, allowing her to become insightful and empathetic as well. She has great chemistry with the other characters, from her friends to her rivals, and overcomes incredible personal and professional struggles. You, the player, witness all of this, and her journey makes each success triumphant and each setback devastating. That connection to the protagonist makes the Trails in the Sky series all the more powerful for me personally. Estelle Bright is without a doubt one of my favorite video game protagonists of all time, and an amazing character. Thank you for watching to the end of this long video, and for tuning in to the first episode in this new series. Please leave suggestions for characters to cover in this series, thoughts on Estelle Bright, or feedback on the video in the comments. I would also be super grateful if you gave this video a like and shared it around. This video took a lot of time and effort, and I'm really hoping you all enjoy it. If you did and you're not subscribed already, please consider doing so. I'd love for the channel to keep growing and reach new people. Thank you for your support, and I hope to see you all next time. Have a great day, and happy gaming.